So what I want to talk about today is probability and logic. Now let's start with logic, since you can think of probability as an extension of logic. So when I talk about a logical statement, I mean a statement which is either true or false. So for example, I might say that 3 plus 4 equals 7. That's going to be true. But if I said 3 plus 4 equals 6, that's a false statement. So those are both examples of logical statements. Now I might say something like x equals 6. And I might not know whether that's a true statement or a false statement. If it's the solution to 2x equals 12, then it might be true. But if x is the solution to 2x equals 10, then that would be a false statement. So when I'm dealing with variables, it's going to depend the truth of a statement on what value I actually assign to the variable. So now that I have these true and false statements, I want to turn them into numbers. Of course, if I'm dealing with a computer, at the end of the day, a computer deals with bits. It deals with zeros and ones. And so in order to do that, I'm going to make the following definition, which is called the indicator function. And for the indicator function, I'm going to use a Blackboard boldface I, capital I. And if I feed as input to that indicator function a true statement, then I'm going to return the number 1. If I feed to that indicator function a false statement, then I'm going to return the number 0. Now I should mention that there is more than one notation for an indicator function. So for instance, uh, sometimes instead of using a blackboard boldface i, we use a blackboard boldface 1. Sometimes we just use a bolded 1. We shade the lines. Sometimes we even use a capital letter chi. But for our purposes, I'm just going to use this blackboard boldface capital I. And that's going to be my indicator function. Now, one nice thing about the indicator function that I should point out is that it allows me to count the number of true statements in a collection of true statements, of logical statements. So for instance, suppose that S1 was 3 plus 4 equals 7. Suppose that S2 was 3 plus 4 equals 6, and S3 was 1 minus 2 equals negative 1. Now, those three statements, out of those three statements, only two of them are true. Notice that if I take the sum as i goes from 1 to 3 of the indicator functions of those statements, I'll get the indicator function of S1 plus the indicator function of S2 plus the indicator function of S3. And so that's going to be 1 plus 0 plus 1 or 2. Now this property, that summing up indicator functions, counts the number of things which are true in a collection, is going to be very helpful later on in the course. So that's why I'm bringing it up now. The next thing that I want to point out is that there are often problems or things that we don't know for sure whether they're true or not. So for example, is 23457131833 prime? It might be prime. It might not be prime. But until we do the work, until we either run it through a primality testing program or check all the factors up to the square root of the number, we don't know whether or not it's going to be prime or not. Another example of this type of statement is who will win the next presidential election? If you're watching this video before November 2020, as written, it's not a logical statement, but let's say, let's make it more specific. Let's consider the statements, Joe Biden will win the next presidential election. 
That's a logical statement. It may be true, it may be false, but it is a logical statement. Unfortunately, if you were watching this video before uh, November 7th of 2020, you don't know the answer to that. And so to deal with statements that we don't know the full information, but we only have partial information, that's when we use probability functions. Another example of this, this is a six-sided die. It has the numbers one through six written on each of the six sides. And when I roll this die, it will come up as a specific number, four in that case, three in that case. Now, before I show you the outcome of that die, you know that the statement that die equals three is either true or false, but you don't have total information about it. Until I remove my hand and we see, ah, it was a six, do we know that that statement, the die comes up three? The next roll of the die, that's unknown whether or not it's true or false. To deal with that, we create what are called probability functions. And when we have a probability function, we typically use a blackboard boldface P. That's like a capital P, but with an extra stroke drawn. And this measures the chance that statement P is true. So probability functions reflect the fact that even though we don't know exactly whether something is true or not, we may be able to figure out the probability that it's true or not. Now, if something is always false, then we assign the probability of P to be zero. And if P is always true, then we assign the probability of P to be one. So in a way, the probability associated with P is an extension of the indicator function. The probability function extends the indicator function. So how do we decide, how to decide probabilities? Well, one simple tool that we have is called the principal of indifference. And what the principle of indifference tells us is that if we know nothing about the outcome, then each outcome is equally likely. So in other words, if we've got a bunch of possibilities and we don't know what's gonna happen. So on my six-sided die, the answer could be six, it could be five, it could be four, it could be two, it could be one. So what I'm gonna say is the, if D is the role of this fair six-sided die, I'm going to say that the probability that D equals one equals the probability that D equals two equals the probability that D equals three and so on up to the probability that D equals six. All of these things are equally likely. Now, moreover, I'm just going to go ahead and split the truth, which has probability one equally among these six possibilities. So I'm going to split true, which has probability one among the possibilities. Now, 
This only works when you're dealing with things for which you have no idea whether it's going to be true or not. As I'm sitting here in Southern California, if you ask me, will tomorrow be a sunny day or a rainy day? I know that there's much more than a one half chance that it's going to be a sunny day rather than a rainy day. You should use when you have prior information about an outcome, you should use that in determining probabilities. But if I have this die that I have no idea whether it's weighted or not, then it makes sense to say that the probability that D equals three is gonna be one sixth. And the probability that D equals four is gonna be one sixth. And in general, the probability that D equals I is gonna be one sixth for any i from 1 up to 6. So that's probabilities and logic in a nutshell. Just to review what we covered, we said that for a logical statement, we're working with something which is either true or false has to be one of those two things. So none of these statements about this statement is false or all Cretans are liar, I am a Cretan. I'm only gonna worry about statements which I can determine to be either true or false. Now the indicator function that we talked about turns true statements into a one, it turns false statements into a zero. If I sum up the indicator function of a bunch of statements, I get the number of statements which are true. And finally, I can extend indicator functions to be probability functions. I'm gonna use a capital blackboard boldface P in order to denote a probability function. It's an extension of the indicator function. And the only way right now we have of determining probabilities is this principle of indifference, which says if we know nothing at all about the outcomes, then each outcome is equally likely. And that helps us find probabilities for simple problems where we have no knowledge about which outcome is likelier than any of the others. Thanks for listening.